Um, hello, everyone. Uh, uh, my name is Glenn Ruben de Souza. Uh, I'm part of the 10th cohort of the Young India Fellowship. So today we are going to have a panel discussion, uh, the YF Pathways of Possibility on the topic of postgraduate and doctoral education. And we're also going to engage with the YF alumni. So before we begin, I will give a brief description of the Young India Fellowship. So the Young India Fellowship is a one year postgraduate diploma in liberal studies. And ever since its inception a decade ago, the Young India Fellowship has helped individuals switch career paths meaningfully and also explore diverse areas of study and practice, grow further as a working professional, start organizations and create sustainable impact while solving problems at the core of our society, all while belonging to a global community of fellows. Uh, for me personally, the fellowship has been fulfilling and, and I've been able to learn a lot. And I've also been able to explore different facets and enjoy to the fullest. Uh, one of the best things the fellowship has provided with me with are the peers and the friends. So who have taught me so much from cooking to solving cases. Uh, and I know this bond will last a lifetime. Uh, I'm pretty sure the alums on the call would also agree to this. So let me start by introducing the moderator for today, George Jacob. So George is currently a product manager at Groupon. He loves problem solving in the cross-functional technology space and has worked in tech product teams across Fortune 500 to nonprofit and B2C to platform services. George did his bachelor's in electronics and computer science engineering mm -hmm. from NIT Trichy and graduated with a master's in computer engineering from Georgia Tech. He's a proud Young India Fellow of the batch of 2018. He's a JN Tata Scholar and a KC Mahindra Scholar too. So he's an avid theater ent enthusiast and a foodie. So a quirk about him is he can always be found planning a road trip for the next long weekend. So over to you, George. Yeah. Thank you, Glenn. Thank you for the introduction. Um, if our other panelists could switch on their videos. Hi, love. Hi, Saloni. Okay, uh, so good morning. So just setting the stage for our panel today. Um, We'd like to take some time to introduce you to some of the fellows from the Young India Fellowship who have gone on to pursue their master's and their doctoral studies. We'll kind of take you through our journey, take you to our back through our background, the things that we were thinking as we went through this journey, and uh, hopefully we'll entertain your questions at the end too. So I'm really excited because we've got a variety of backgrounds here today, and it should be a very interesting conversation. So uh, just a thing to note, one of our panelists, Sudarshana Chanda, could not make it today because of a health emergency. But um, I still think we've got great panelists on board, so let's have fun. I will now introduce our panelists, Love Kanoi. So Love is currently undertaking his doctoral research at the Department of Anthropology and School of Environment at Yale, where he is also affiliated with a number of different programs and centers. His research draws on work in the social and natural sciences and the humanities. Love was previously trained in literature with his bachelor's and master's from the Department of English at Jadhupur University. And he was part of the first YF batch on campus 2014-2015. Um, Love's previous experiences in the academy include teaching and research engagements at Jadhupur, where he was a project fellow at the School of Cultural Texts and Records and at Ashoka, where he worked on research and strategy in the vice chancellor's office with the then vice chancellor Pratap Banu Mehta and also taught his own full undergraduate class on Greek tragedy, becoming the first YF to ever do so. Love also worked in management consulting and government policy and program implementation before returning to academia. Among other things, Love nurtures a deep interest in languages and has published translations across classical Latin to English and contemporary languages, Bengali to Hindi and English to Hindi, and the most recent of which is called Chai Vard. I hope I pronounced that correctly, Love. And is available on Amazon for purchase. Welcome, Love. You know, virtual round of applause. <laughs> Hi, George. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for that generous introduction. Thank you. <laughs> well, introducing Saloni. So Saloni is currently pursuing a PhD in political science. Her work involves leveraging her background in engineering to apply methods from data science and machine learning to understanding social phenomena. Prior to graduate school, Saloni spent time working as a management consultant, pursued the YAF 
and MLS in computer science and worked with the TCPD, the Trivedi Center for Political Academy. So we will talk all about that at Ashoka University as a research fellow, where she built open source tools and trained journalists and researchers in quantitative methods, in addition to her research projects. Her most recent work involves studying bias and efficiency in the Indian, Indian judiciary with the World Bank. Welcome, Saloni. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction, George. Awesome. So um, I know this has been a very, this is me introducing you. Just to kick things off, could you just give a short introduction of yourself, where you are currently, the batch of the fellowship you're from, what you do today, and something fun about yourself, and then we'll kick off all the serious talk. Saloni, do you want to take a stab at that? Sure. OK. Um, so I'm from the 2016-2017 batch of the Young India Fellowship uh, and on the course of uh, what we'll talk about during this session, I'll tell you a little more about like how I came about to where what I'm doing right now. But in a snapshot, uh, my work right now involves uh, essentially analyzing large data sets to learn about government institutions and questions about human development. So particularly kind of trying to get rid of the jargon, my work sits under this discipline called computational social science, wherein methods from data science and machine learning can be applied to learn about questions about social science, essentially. Uh, and for instance, like what, what can large scale textual data about what parliamentarians speak in, uh, uh, in the parliament, essentially, uh, can tell us about the behavior of legislators, or what can large scale data about uh, judgments in courts tell us about judiciary uh, and the way it's functioning and judicial bias, uh, things like that. Um, something I do for fun, I don't have too many opportunities for fun these days because of the situation we are in, but I cook and then I eat. So that's, that's essentially what I do for fun these days. Uh, yeah, that's that's about me. Uh, Love. Do you want to take take a shot? Thanks, Saloni. I wish I wish I had your cooking skills. For me, uh, cooking is more labor than love. But we must all eat. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, thanks again, George, for this introduction and to the YF team for organizing this and to all people who are part of this. Uh, attendees as well. So glad you're all here. My name is Love Kanoi. Uh, I was in the 2014-15 batch. We pride ourselves on being the first batch on campus. We find a first for something or the other, or, always. Uh, currently, I'm undertaking a PhD at, at Yale University. It's jointly in the Department of Anthropology and School of the Environment, formerly known as the School of Forestry and Environmental Studies. My work, um, it's, it's at the intersection of anthropology and the environment. So it draws on fields like political ecology, urban anthropology, the, the natural sciences, the humanities, and such like. Um, and I'm basically exploring issues of, of water. Unlike Saloni, whose uh, work focuses on quantitative stuff, anthropology prides itself and seeks to distinguish itself by focusing on qualitative approaches. So they're two different methods, and I think that's great because we can sort of like talk about slightly different ways to talk about the social sciences today, what their strengths, merits, our respective journeys are. So what I, what I do for fun, um, I like to have chai. <laughs> uh, I like to listen to birds. Um, read, uh, play some music sometimes, things like that, yeah. That's great to hear, thank you so much. <laughs> yeah, I, I can attest to the fact that I've seen chai, love drink large numbers of glasses of chai on campus while I met him there, so I can totally attest to that. <laughs> All right, so um, kind of like jumping into like uh, the journey, like one thing I think we'd like to highlight to this panel is, can I talk about how like the different journeys that we all face through before the fellowship, while at the fellowship and after, because I think we all come from such different backgrounds, we're doing such different things and there's so much to learn from our journeys. So just to like set the stage and begin the journey, could you take a stab at what your journey before the fellowship was in terms of your education, your work experience and kind of lead it up into finally what made you decide to apply for the Young India Fellowship at the first place? Saloni, very curious to know. Yep, sure. Um, so at least in my case, uh, uh, as we kind of talked about earlier, I was I pursued a bachelor's in uh, engineering uh, in information technology, and then I went on to work as a management consultant at a steel company uh, for a couple of years. Why I did apply to YF is that I think the work uh, when I was working, I think that was also the time when I kind of started reading a lot of nonfiction work in behavioral sciences. And the kind of question that I kept asking myself after reading a book uh, 
was like, how can I do what they're doing? And I had no idea, right? Because they were running experiments. They were learning these things about how people think and how they act. And all I wanted to know was like, this, this is something that's really cool and much more interesting than what I do on a daily basis. So how is it that I can actually go about doing something like that? Um, so that's, that's what kind of got me to kind of start talking to people about uh, what it is to really pursue a PhD, what kind of work they do after a PhD. And, in, in that process, I kind of started to realize that there were like not many people I could talk to about this. Um, and, and then the YAF kind of started making sense that, okay, you know, there's, there's a broad sense of courses that I can take, uh, you know, things that I can think about during the year, people I can talk to perhaps uh, to help me figure out like, how is it that I can do what they do in the books? So <laughs> that's, that's really that got me to apply for the YAF uh, broadly, yeah. Oh, that's no, that, that's great to hear, you know, like everyone has an origin story and that sounds like a great, you know, origin story for thinking, why the why? No, that's great. Thank you, Saloni. What about you, love? Like what made you decide one fine day to apply for the Young India Fellowship? And you know, or like what, what, what led up to that? You know? I wanted to be in Delhi. No, I'm, I'm kidding. So I grew up in Calcutta. Uh, I, I do like Delhi, but I grew up in Calcutta. And uh, when I was in school, um, I was, I guess I was a bit of a, 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 you know, a rebel child, but I loved physics and math and just playing with those ideas. So I thought I was going to do a degree in physics or math, but as it turned out, a friend sort of like persuaded me to write the Jadavpur entrance examination in the department of English. And I, I can never forget that, that those questions, they were asking me things about, for example, Rolling Stones, the Beatles, um, Calvin and Hobbes, the comic, not the philosophers, uh, though one could have drawn on the theology as well. Uh, but the point was that, you know, I just fell in love with those questions and, you know, Jadavpur became my first home and I spent almost six and a half years there, three years for undergrad, two years for masters and a year and a half after that working at the School of Cultural Text and Records. So when I became an adult, uh, the world that I knew was the academy. That was all I saw. That was all I knew. But then I transitioned out for a short period before coming to the YF, partly because I didn't want to be in the academy at that point of time. This is, this is like 2012, 13, large, you know, private universities were still slow in the uptake in India. We had this rather difficult, uh, depressing system called the NET, which one had to write. And at that point of time, I don't know if changes have happened, but at that point of time, for your discipline, my discipline, literature at that point of time, they would ask me questions like, what is the birth date of Milton's second wife? Who cares, right? So it, was, it, it wasn't something that I could see myself doing thereafter. Also at that point of time, I was sure I didn't want to do a PhD outside the country. Well, very strongly about doing a PhD in the country. Of course, things have changed in, in the time since. When the YF had happened, I actually wanted to move outside the academy. I wanted to work with government primarily. And one, the YF seemed like a great way to do this. Many of the attractions of the YF, of course, were the interdisciplinary stuff. So I had met Andre Bethe uh, fortuitously in Calcutta. He'd come to give a lecture and I was talking with him after the lecture and he spoke about teaching sociology at Ashoka. And he was like, you know, I teach sociology for six weeks and, you know, at, at the Delhi school, I teach it for six years. So, you know, how, how am I expected to teach sociology in six weeks to a bunch of people who don't know what sociology is? And he said, I'm not expected to teach sociology. I'm expected to teach sociological reasoning. And that made sense. And then when I started looking at the YF curriculum through that angle, it, it made sense to become at least conversant with the tools of different disciplines, the methods of different disciplines, not because you're becoming an expert in them, but you're getting sort of like an informed introduction to those fields. And then I came to the YF and then I moved outside the academy. The academy was my first love. Uh, but even at Jadavpur, I remember speaking with a senior who told me very presciently and sagaciously that should you wish to leave the academy, do so now. Explore the wider world. And if you wish to come back and you know you want to come back, then you probably will come back, but you know that you belong here. Um, so that was the movement out for me. And I did a bunch of other things. And then I realized that I missed being in the academy. And... Uh, Fortunately, you know, with this kind of solid training experience through these two different institutions, I figured I could find a home here. And um, post the fellowship, I had another year at Ashoka, George mentioned, I was working with, with uh, the vice chancellor then at uh, the vice chancellor's office, also teaching. And that sort of like reinforced uh, my commitment to, to, so to speak, personal academy, not academy at scale, not education at scale, but sort of like one-on-one -on -one kind of teaching, learning research. So, yeah. Uh, but the YF was attractive because precisely because there were so many new things to learn. I mean, I had a very liberal training at Jadavpur, but here I was also reading things like political economy. I was reading things like mathematical reasoning, uh, those group group dynamics, you know, management. Uh, I was a lit student, skeptical of management studies, but now, you know, here I was learning from le learning leadership from, you know, 
people like that. So this mix of different reasons was it. So I'm not going to go on about the wire, peer learning, ELMs, uh, mentorship yeah. from industry stalwarts. There's there's a whole lot to it. Yeah. No, no, that's exactly. So you kind of like segue into what I wanted to touch upon next. Like, you know, what did like in retrospect, you know, you can say, oh yeah, in my past few years, I did these and this how it all fit in. But if you dial back the, the clock and say like, and think, okay, what did you end up doing in your one year at the fellowship? You know, like so, like what did you do? I think like the fellowship changes from year to year. It's very different for people to people. So like, um, it's very interesting to take that one year snapshot and say, hey, what did I do in my one year of the fellowship? So like, what did you do in your one year at the fellowship love that while you, while you were there in that one year, you know? Yeah. I, I, thanks, Joe. That's a great question. For me, Saloni, if I may, I, I had two big things. Uh, one thing I was, I was certain that I wanted to indiscriminately learn. So if back then we had like 24 credits, I think, right? And uh, we had very few optionals at that point of time. You could choose like two courses or something in, in, the, in the program at that, at that point of time. But the idea was to go as deep as I could within, you know, these new disciplines, knowing, for example, I'm not going to become an expert in Keynes, you know, uh, JM Keynes in like after a six week course. But, you know, what can I learn from, say, Mihil Bago teaching or, or, you know, for somebody else uh, teaching uh, in such a short period? The other thing I wanted to make sure was I wanted to make friendships, uh, find some friends and I've been blessed to have made some really good friends at the fellowship, who I hope will walk uh, a large section of this journey of life. With me. So there was indiscriminate learning, you know, social commitments of this kind, getting to know people, meeting people from around the country. And that was one thing that was perhaps missing from my Jadavpur education. I mean, Jadavpur is a great university, but it's, it's a state university in Calcutta. So, you know, the kind of diversity of students. My roommate was from, from, from Chennai. He's my brother from another mother, right? I, I would never have met him in, in Jadavpur for better or for worse, right? So many others, things like that. So these were the two things high on my priority, you know, learning as much as I can about new things and making you know, deep friendships. Awesome, that, that makes sense. That's a good overview of like your, 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 your objective for the one year at the fellowship, you know. Like, what about you, Saloni? Like, you know, like if you had to like summarize, what did you end up doing in that one year at the fellowship? I know it's a very loaded question. There's so much that can go into it, like, but feel free to take your time with that. You know? So what did you do in your one year at the fellowship? Yeah, to kind of just echo exactly what Love said, um, that there was a bunch of us, we used to call ourselves the FOMO YAFs, which basically meant we just had the fear of missing out on like amazing courses that were going on. So we, we essentially used to go for like every lecture, electives that we weren't taking really, we would just go and sit and listen in to professors uh, uh, who were talking about different things. And like, for me, I think that was like the most fun that, uh, uh, thing that we kind of did uh, during the year is essentially get an idea of like very very diverse courses how people think about uh, disciplines the kind of work that they do and uh, and I think that that was important but like beyond that very kind of how do I say it uh, uh, very functionally what I could kind of gain from the one year was interacting with faculty like one of the things one of the first things I remember doing uh, when I came into YF is we, we had the course by Professor Dwight and I went for his office hours and the first thing I did was like how do you do a PhD how do you get in what do you think of what do you do after a PhD why do you do a PhD you know things like that uh, which were like questions of the top of my ha head that you know I finally had someone to kind of you know listen to and kind of give me ideas about like what I should be doing and who I should be talking to and like I think those conversations, both with faculty and with alumni who are having these same questions, would kind of figure out a little more for themselves. For me, I think one the one year was really helpful to kind of uh, reach out to people, ask them what is it that they're doing, why is it that they're doing what they're doing, and like how how can I kind of uh, figure these things out. And very naively, I think when I came into YF, I thought that oh, you know what, I could like do a bunch of different courses and learn about research. Uh, I think it's an important caveat to make like that's not what you will end up doing at YAF in no way the one year was kind of sufficient for me to you know get the kind of training or research skills to prepare me for a PhD program uh, in any sense but what the takeaway was for me was that I at least could now finally um, use the right words about the questions that I was interested in to do research about uh, knowing that language really kind of at least coming from an engineering background who'd never taken a course in social sciences uh, uh, before kind of coming to the YAF, just learning what, 
how you kind of talk about these questions what what are the questions that are of interest to you i think figuring those out through the coursework and then bouncing that off with you know uh, alumni faculty uh, was like extremely kind of helpful in figuring it out another uh, caveat that i just want to kind of play in is that i don't think in and this is something we talked about before I don't think the YIF is the only route to kind of achieve these things. Uh, a lot is contingent on who you are, where you come from, who you know, what you're thinking, at what point of time uh, in life are you making these decisions. So uh, by no means are these like the only way to kind of make the decisions that you make when you kind of decide that, oh, you know, maybe do doctoral studies are something that you're interested in. Uh, but having said that, YIF does give you, uh, or, or at least opens doors to like, you know, at least uh, to talk to different people and like kind of pick up on different coursework that you can kind of learn from and engage in uh, to figure things out for yourself. Um, so yeah, that that's what my one year looked like. That, that makes sense. And like, it, it's so interesting that, yeah, like, so even like, so as you mentioned, right, so coming from like, one of the first things that struck me when I came in as an engineer, so all the social sciences, and in my first month, I had to write a paper we had a course on history, memory, and memorialization by Nanjot Lahiri. And our first thing was to write a research paper. And me as an engineer, I'm like, oh, how hard can it be, right? It's, it's logical short sentences, but the fear and the apprehension of writing something for like 1,500 words was something that I'm like, huh, this is interesting. I never knew it would be so difficult. And so I had to spend a lot of time just getting over that metal bump. But yeah, like, so like I echo a lot with what, what both of you said. So even for me, like coming into the fellowship, like because I, I did my undergraduate in, in engineering and I'd already decided and I'd applied for my admit at Georgia Tech. So I knew I was going to do my master's at Georgia Tech. And so for me, that one year was all about, I'm going to stay as far away from engineering as possible. I'm going to learn about as many different things that are. And I was also going through this dilemma of, you know, what is a career in tech? Like, you know, what does it mean? Where can I apply myself to? What are the other things in tech that I can do apart from being a software developer, which is great. And so as like, I use that time to like, think about, oh, what courses can I take? Or who can I, what is this policy thing all about? I still remember sitting in a mess and asking my friend, listen, I know it's a very dumb question, but can you just tell me what this whole public policy thing is all about? Like, cause I've read about it online, but I don't know any you've done this. Can you please tell me what that is? So. A year to just experiment and just ask questions and ask shameless questions was a, was a lot of what that one year for me was too. So that's great. Um, so one question is, um, was your experience at the fellowship different than one you, what you expected coming in? Because all of us, when we, when we apply for the fellowship, we think about, oh, there's this program, there's this things I can do, there are these things I can take away, you know, but can you talk about, like, hey, what are some unexpected things that you encounter on the way? Or was something that you're like, huh? I didn't think of that, or maybe this is not what it was for me. You know, which, do any of you want to take a stab at that? Yeah, I can. I can take a go. Uh, I think uh, again, very naively, when I came into the fellowship, I didn't realize that. I mean, I'd, I'd heard like it's all about peer learning, blah blah blah, but I didn't really kind of think that that was the most useful part. I was like, okay, great, I'm going to do this course, and this is how it's going to help me, and like this is what I'm going to do after that. But I think that was like the biggest surprise that for me, like, again, the biggest takeaways have been these conversations with people who who not only kind of shaped uh, how I think about, like, say, subjects or even uh, kind of make or at least shaped how I think of like making decisions and like big decisions in life. Right. Uh, what is it that would kind of help me uh, in getting to what I want to do? And, and I think that was something I didn't expect or didn't anticipate it to have such a big effect um, as as to the extent that it did. Uh, so I think I think like very meta in a very meta way, I think, yeah, that's, that's the people and their advice and that the way that they thought that really shaped a lot of outcomes for me, uh, which I didn't expect at all. That makes sense. What about you, Love? Was there something that you experienced that you surprising when you came and you're like, this is the, what I expected? Yeah. I was I was I was thinking back to seven seven odd years ago uh, that moment. So a couple of things. I think what Saloni said about different people, their their journeys, their preferences, and their prioritization of things in their life, and the logics they gave to do follow those preferences was important. Uh, especially because when when I was living in such close quarters, literally, it was one that one year feels like a lot longer uh, for better or for worse. But uh, 
in terms of the bad unexpected thing um for me the university continues to be a sacred space i you know i, I felt a little uncomfortable with, with with a party culture that sometimes seem to overstep its bounds i'll be frank about this but on the other hand one of the things that i was most i think uh, pleasantly surprised by and remember with uh, gratitude is until that point whatever pedagogic exposure i had it was it was really about you do your work in isolation right you work with a set of ideas you read some complicated texts you mull through these ideas you bring in complicated theorists whose names you can't pronounce and then you put it all down on a piece of paper right in an end term examination or a mid term examination or whatever it is but uh, the assignment structure of course varied considerably between courses at the yf but there were several 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 courses where there was so much group work right now in this group work peer learning is not so much about you know an individual who knows you know for example coding who's teaching me how to code but more about being able to figure out a set of problems and delivering our perspective solutions answers whatever in a way that's agreeable amongst the group largely uh, through these different things finding consensus building that consensus uh, and then articulating that on paper while deferring to each other so to speak different skill sets and such like i think that was really 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 pleasurable fortunately in my case uh, the the people i had the 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 good fortune of you know, sort of like teaming up with across these different courses were mostly very committed to what they had to do uh, which meant that that learning was not a burden it could be fun which also meant that we could argue with each other but learn in the process of this and i think that was one of the one of the few things that i you know one of the the main things that i i didn't think about the fellowship before taking up i i didn't come in with too many expectations but this was certainly something i didn't anticipate but but i think i i greatly benefited from and really enjoyed and i think that continues to hold true of the fellowship over over this entire 10 year period and in the years to come so that that that's that's super great to hear and i think one other thing that saloni touched upon that i will ask you to continue to touch upon is saloni talked about her takeaways from the entire experience and at the end of the year what were your i don't know snapshot takeaways at the end of that one year of the fellowship well at the at the risk of sounding um moralistic or uh, or giving aphorisms i think it reinforced my commitment uh to the idea that good people can do good things right uh and whatever it is you could be working in in art history you could choose to work in public policy george whatever that is <laughs> uh, engineer uh whatever you choose to do right that it's possible to to work see that one sometimes battles a kind of 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 you know skepticism or a certain kind of pessimism philosophers have written about this for 2 and a half thousand 5000 years really the classic ethical question why do good people suffer and bad men prosper right this is not something you want to believe as you grow through life right i think in 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 my exposure to to folks at the fellowship showed me that uh or so strengthen that conviction that, that that's not necessarily true you know you can be good do good work without so to speak ripping the world uh dry age of climate change good work good corporations you know doesn't have to come at the cost of natural resource management from of course there are lots of politics we can complicate all of this of course but in principle that this 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 can work and that if you have good people around you they can carry you uh, in your life uh, through with them i think that was one of my uh, most important so to speak uh take away so apart from that of course you know, i i treasure the fellowship here i i learned a lot i gained a lot i i changed a lot as an individual i met you know lots of wonderful people both in my in my cohort as eloni was mentioning before as well people you could walk up to you know i couldn't imagine walking up and talking to a dwight for example or a kenwin you know in prior years for example right uh and then having and just the nature of the fellowship even though we'd moved to sony pad at that point of time it's still incredibly well connected right so when an ak shiv kumar comes to talk about economics you know you're you're having it in some sense from the horse's mouth right uh and you have this entire richness of this and it's not just in that sense academics you all you're also getting these industry folks coming and talking about it you have tiger tyagrajan coming from gen pack and talking about it. you have ashish dhawan coming and talking about it. incredible work and you know you get to see some of this learning in that too and i think those were some of the things that i would probably say i'm taking away uh in fellowship And this thing that you continue to do what you love to do, and you know, passion is an overrated thing. It can it can damn you in a lot of trouble. Uh, but 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 you know, to a certain extent, moderately, you can choose to follow your passions, smartly, not blindly, and still live a reasonably good life. And I think that's that's it. 
Yeah, that, that's, that's super interesting that you say that. Just to kind of build on exactly what you said. I think for me, um, I think the binary of like good and bad uh, kind of failed to capture like one thing about it that kind of was that I was left with was just people are really hopeful about the future and and, and they're, they're actually trying to do things that could you know uh, that I think that it's it still remains a kind of an island uh, like the kind of Ashoka network and the YF network that I have and the conversations that I kind of bounce off with that network are like wildly different from what I could talk be talking to with my engineering friends about so I I think one of the things that that's kind of what do you say um, that's kind of really different and like kind of sets the uh, that cohort apart for me is is just the fact that, that they're extremely hopeful people which and positively hopeful people which is which is I think that's just superb. Yeah, no, so like I, I was just reflecting on this, and so like one thing I think all of us talk about are the peers and like. The learning you have from them oh like oh this is a career possibility like really like uh, like th that can be done so questions like that uh being able to talk to alumni and like ask all your dumb questions and ask like what how does it really work in the real world you know that like, you get your idealistic view from the fellows who are in the fellowship and you get kind of like a hey this is what it really means out in the industry or out in academia by uh alumni out there so uh that was like the, the people are i think a big takeaway People are a big takeaway, you know, from uh, from the fellowship as well. And so, one thing I like, I found personally that I, helped me a lot was um, I thought like one thing that I didn't expect from the fellowship to like really make me revalue how I work. The thought was the critical writing program, and like I really wanted to like plug that in and mention that in because someone mentioned it in one of the questions as well. Like for me. I thought I knew how to write because, hey, I can write. I'm like, how hard is it in my 12th grade CBC exam? They ask you to write an, an essay about this and you write it and it's fine. Like, what is writing all about? And I can do that. And uh, one thing that the, I think we have, we have an eight month critical writing program at the, at the fellowship and that really broke things down for me. And it, the first two months were demoralizing. I'm like, I don't know how to write. I don't know how to think. And like one of my preceptors like simplified it for me and said like, writing is all about thinking. If you can think and structure that properly and you take your time with it, you can convey that in writing. And so like just knowing how to like, I know it sounds weird, but knowing how to write properly or learn that there is a way to write and think about writing was something that for me as an engineer, I never really thought I would want to learn coming in, but that's really shaped a lot of how I think and how I, how I present at work today or how I make my documents is always this meta thinking about thinking. Like that's one of my big takeaways in terms of just like, okay, I learned a valuable, valuable skill that I still carry with me today. Like that's one of the things that, that, that stays true for me. Uh, also wanting to just kind of dovetail on exactly that. Um, uh, I think a particular instance for me was uh, when the first courses that I could took in during the YF was a history course and I remember going up to the teaching assistant and asking her like is it okay if we write in points and she just gave me this like dark stare of like what do you mean write in points and that's that's how like you know we, we engineers think and write like you know oh, A, B, C and that's that's about it and and what really kind of helped me in through the critical writing course is like you have an argument you need to reason through it you can't just have points in isolation that that's not something that's not how you would think or that's not how you would convince someone about the way uh, uh, or at least communicate the way you're thinking uh, and and yes I, I would completely agree that the writing course at least for me again uh, just to kind of break things down logically and make an argument which is like kind of reasoned well uh, again both through the writing courses and also through the papers we had to submit for uh, our coursework uh, i think that that was like super helpful uh, for for engineers definitely very do i remember sitting there and like me and my friend we we're sitting there we we're struggling and the other members in the class all of them from the social sciences background who've done their psychology and literature and they're all like yeah just sure just thousand five hundred words you can just turn that out now like wait what like like, you know, you go in feeling like, like there are things that I don't know and I'm not good at. And that's what I love about, the, like, a lot about the grading and all the courses that we take up. is the, it, There's no pressure to perform or to, like, really score this well because that's what's determining your worth. It's a very low-pressure environment for you to say, like, hey, like, if you want to do it, you can do it. If you want to learn how to write a paper, 
you can and we'll help you do that but if you don't want to you don't there's, there's no pressure <laughs> yes awesome so on on the writing point george i think for the benefit of attendees i think it might be useful to emphasize that the writing program is now is is a concurrent one year program uh, mm -hmm. now in the y which wasn't the case earlier but now effectively you take this these writing modules through every term and at the end of which you may sort of like have a paper that you want to publish or you create an anthology from the university along with other papers but it's a sustained exercise in in, in critical thinking as well just wanted to just plug that in there. and i think it's something that distinguishes the this one year program i mean a bunch of universities uh, globally have writing centers to to support writing endeavors and they do this training but i think the fact that the wife mandates this through the year is important now there might be people who are coming from a social science background and you might think that you know i have you know been writing essays for most of my adult life you know what new things can i learn because i think you know in that sense perhaps that's true but you know like any good musician the more you practice the sweeter your rag sounds so the more you write you know the more convincing your arguments get so i think in that sense uh even if you have been trained in writing before the fact that there is this one year program can still so strengthen your uh, wet your sword appetite well else well i love you thank you for that so um so i, I like I mean, so it, i think we've touched upon like things from the fellowship that we really enjoyed or we, that really spoke to us and things we took away you know so kind of trying to take a step back and um you know not i won't say be on theme but like where in this like so before the fellowship you heard about it you came and you did it and then so could you touch upon like kind of your journey like post that one year and along where in this journey did you decide hey i want to apply for a phd or i am going to pursue it. like where did that strike and like what factors kind of came into that decision so if you could touch upon that so long that be great Yeah, sure. Um, as I said, like I, I kind of came in to the YF knowing that this is what I want to figure out, and I came out of YF knowing that this is what I want to do. So, uh, what what kind what it kind of left me with is like, again, as I said, in no way it's it's enough to just do the YF and start thinking about like doctoral education. Uh, gives you a lot of breadth, but not enough depth. Uh, in things that you might want to do, say, you know. research on so for me what what i ended up again uh doing was uh what others have also done before me like the one year uh, masters that you can kind of supplement your yf with uh, a lot of uh, fellows had gone ahead and done the mls the masters in liberal studies at ashoka uh, which is essentially like a one year extension where you can kind just of stay on a uh, uh, uh work with mentors faculty associated with a particular department and then go on to kind of you know do what you want to do and some most of them kind of go on for like higher education uh, or or some of them go on for like a phd program so so for me i think getting trained um, in what uh, what in essentially in quantitative methods because at that time i wasn't really sure like okay political science is going to be my thing uh, for me i was uh, what i thought of was like let me broadly tool up and then kind of see where it uh, where the questions take me uh which is why i did the masters in computer science and there i think for me uh again the one year at mls following it up with two years at the trivedi center for political data really kind of gave me um for me was like some the most ex important exposure i had to have before i started a phd program merely because i think the kind of mentorships that yf uh, were all functional but like uh the ones after yf came in gave me a lot more deeper insight into understanding what i want to do if the phd program is the right way to do it essentially mentors who could kind of advise me on every step kind of look over the list of universities i'm applying to and say that okay here's when you need to be applying here's how you need to be thinking about applications here's how you need to be thinking about research and training and how you kind of approach it these are methods i didn't know about research methods in yif and i can say that like very very shamelessly uh, but but I, for me the journey that comes in after yif was the most important and somehow like the most formative in a sense to kind of prepare me for doc, for like doing a phd program uh, so i I, th i think like um 
yeah that's that's basically what i, what I would say like again the, the the yif does open a lot of avenues and a lot of doors in terms of reaching out to people and learning from people but um, again in a way it's it's sufficient you kind of need to supplement it with either some research experience people go on to do their masters uh, either in india or abroad to kind of help them segue into uh, phd programs uh, and yeah that that was basically what i kind of did uh, after after the yif one thing i really liked about how you phrased it was that you know there was a journey that came after the yif that helped you reach that made you reach where you are today and helped you think and like skilled you up or helped you think of it the right way so like my from my experience um, i did my bachelor's and i did, I, I immediately joined the fellowship and before i even joined the fellowship i already had my masters in mitra georgia tech so i had like back to back i knew i was going to do my masters right but in that one year i thought i got to think very deeply about what am i even doing my masters in does this area make sense okay this area does make sense so what do i want to do after my masters how does that play into and so if i hadn't done the fellowship what i'd be doing after my masters would have been very different so i was able to as you said take the time think about it talk to faculty do my research understand the space i talked to alumni who had graduated with their technical masters and who are working with tech companies and i got to talk to them so a lot of my journey not just in my masters but after my masters is like what the fellowship like helped me like skilled me up on so that really played a a factor into uh, my journey after the fellowship and my decision to pursue my masters but what about you la like what is the the question of what is your post college journey and when did you decide cool i'm going to do my phd and this thanks george i i i'll spare you the gory details but i'm just i'm i'm just thinking uh, reflecting on a couple of things um that you and saloni just spoke of and i think what glen might have mentioned earlier as well um about the why of being um, a platform where people can you know, move across the space right i i want to momentarily sort of like emphasize that this need not be the case you could be a history student who comes to the why and then does a history phd or you could be an engineering student who comes to the why and then does an engineering phd or you could be an engineer who then you know becomes a psychologist or a literature person we unfortunately rarely hear of a literature person in india becoming say a, you know a physicist but principle that's also possible uh but some of the, so there's some the why sometimes functions to uh create a platform for people to move across disciplines when a lot of this other stuff that saloni also said you know an additional year at the mls becomes useful getting relevant research experience in the new field becomes useful in creating a pitch uh but then there are also transitions that are less so to speak uh stark maybe from say um uh, an economics to public policy right or 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 sociology to public policy versus or, or for example a sociology to literature right arguably less less stark than say an engineer to uh, you know to to political scientist but then you also have and i can think of many of my friends who came to the yf with solid training in the engineering disciplines and then went on right after to do a phd in engineering chemical engineering environmental engineering and such like even in these cases i think the the wire although and this also goes back to what saloni was saying nothing in the wire is in itself adequate by itself for you to make a convincing phd application which in which you likely to get it through but if you work smartly with the resources that the wire offers you the exposure it gives you the people it gives you access to create a story that draws on the work that you have that you've done before right then you'll be able you'll be in a much stronger position to be able to make a make a phd that does not mean that it's going to happen it not necessarily happen need not be in your code and code dream institution but it's entirely certainly possible um in my case uh, very briefly in the post fellowship journey i moved outside the academy like i said i come to the why have to to move outside the academy sometimes and i was seduced by the idea of impact and uh, i i ended up joining management consulting i worked with a firm called the boston consulting group as a consultant uh for for a short period and then i continued to work in consulting i left bcg and i worked with uh the government of himachal pradesh in on an education project so it was a state level education project which i i really enjoyed working with the government uh and this was an education project sort of like strengthened my conviction again in education and i felt that you know there's a lot of stuff happening in education at the school level right k12 level in india i should say that you know i, I want to do this work in india in the long term uh many people you know come to the why have have you know foreign dreams ashish nandir famously said a million people in china and india don't want to go to heaven they want to go to new york did not be true for everybody right um uh 
so but basically this education stuff was was is, was was at the heart of it in in the corporate world you know th there is a lot of talk of play but it tends to be very bounded play right that i i did not at least i did not experience the freedom of ideas that i designed right which is not to say that i could sit like you know like you know like a greek philosopher in a bathtub and just revel in ideas i wouldn't i i do have my material needs and such like but, but the point being that you know education was happening and i could see that there was a lot of work happening in elementary education and i could see there was a lot more requirement for higher education so so i figured that if i want to work in higher education the phd is going to be important there was one important important a couple of things i was of course deeply passionate about the environment for example which is what i'm working on and then i had this uh, thing with with opportunity with with the vice chancellor office which I, which i greatly benefited from because it gave me uh, a perspective on how higher education institutions are run uh, in india regulatory mechanisms and such like and in that period i also had the chance to teach i had taught before but this was the first time i was teaching a full semester length credit course to a bunch of undergraduates and i loved it right i i loved being in the classroom i had 20 odd students uh talking with them reading you know difficult texts uh and then you know having these conversations with them and this was critical for me because you know many people will say why do a phd after phd you can get a job in the industry yes and no many people will still feel that you know a phd is designed to be a professional degree for working in higher education right there are exceptions but that tends to be the premise right you could do a phd and then you know go into for example a ux organization right or you could work with a research consulting firm or you could work with a think tank uh, and it varies the process but the premise unfortunately or fortunately tends to be that if you do a phd you continue working in education so for me that opportunity to teach again and I also ta'd uh, earlier in the year even even for a class i think that george you had taken and all of that was just wonderful and mm -hmm. i think that was the heart of it the fact that the classroom could be a space of critical engagement could be useful could be meaningful could be fun um, and i think that rem it reminded me that that world exists after the ivory towers of of corporate exposure and that world exists in a way where one does not have to like be uh, overly grateful for being able to do what you love unfortunately people still seem to think that if you do what you love you should settle for a lesser pay right you should you should be grateful that you have the opportunity to do what you want to do because otherwise no it is but this showed that there was another way to do it and i think uh, that was one of the reasons why uh, i i was made even more sure of my desire to to take up a phd in the yeah i i just want to touch upon one thing um uh, and and i'm glad love you brought this up like uh, about the general idea of like what kind of motivates people to go in uh, to pursue a phd um, yes you know a love for teaching a love of the classroom a love for just thinking and kind of working out problems is is i think at the heart of it uh, but i think i just want to touch upon another point just to kind of because i know a lot of the people who are going to be watching this are probably people who were thinking about doctoral education uh, five years is a long long time uh, for five years or like depending on your program it's it's much it's much longer as well so uh, i think what what i'm trying to get at is like i think it's important for people to be cognizant about just about uh, it it's great to kind of follow your dreams and follow your passion and do something you love but it also comes in with a lot of privilege to be able to do it and uh, also the fact that okay i can give 5 years of my life to being a student uh, there are other priorities people could have uh, both geographically financially a bunch of different things to kind of consider and and i say this because like i would have loved if someone had like kind of said that to me when i was like thinking of it like these are the things that you need to be aware of uh, and again these these kind of conversations for me came in after the yif uh when like you know mentorship became not like again instrumental but more deeper uh for me when like colleagues and like people who were my mentors would come and ask me these questions uh which were both like deeply personal but but important to kind of consider uh and and that's just something i want to put out there in like in the sense that people should like ask themselves these questions uh not like once but like maybe all the time they're annoying uh to kind of grapple with uh but at the same time i think they're important to kind of get over uh, when they're thinking of this again in the long term both with through thinking about like why i have and also thinking about like what comes later so just wanted to say that no that, that's a good point sloni like keeping it honest making sure that everyone knows like hey if you're applying for a phd got to know what you're going in for it and it's not easy because one thing i've learned so i never did my phd i did my masters but <clears throat> i've been in classrooms with a lot of my 
PhD friends. And one thing I've realized to not ask them is, how is your research going? Uh, that's a big no-no question. It elicits a lot of uh, strong reactions. So yeah, th that makes sense. Thank you for that. Uh, Come on, research is the most fun part of the PhD. Really, really, uh -huh. it doesn't that doesn't that mood alternate from day to day when it, things are going well and things are not going well at all? <laughs> nice, nice. Okay, Look, that's great. Uh, um, briefly, if I may, I think um, to re-emphasize that that point that Saloni made, one must be aware of the long-term commitment of the PhD, right? And the other thing to keep in mind here is that the results of the PhD are not immediate. The results of the PhD are greatly delayed. Right? And this is not just in terms of getting your own degree. You can get that certificate, you know, depending on which program, where you choose to do it in the world. If you do it in Europe between three and four years, America's on the minimum on five years, but can go up to eight, 10 years even, right? Uh, it varies a lot by discipline. But even after you get that degree, you've got your thesis nicely bound, beautiful lettering, right? The chances of that reaching, you know, publication and finding currency in your intellectual circuits, there's still another lag of a few more years. Right? You would be doing your conference circuits, you'd be making your presentations, your journal writings, and all of that would be happening. But your full output, so to speak, will still not see uh, the fruit that you seek to see or the impact that you hope that it will have in any short period. Right? This is unlike many, many other kinds of jobs. You could be in a communication roles and you come up with a portfolio and then you release that within, say, three weeks or six months or whatever it is. Right? You could be in an engineering role and you create a product. Right? And it's out in the market in six to eight months again, or even less, you know, six to eight months is generous, whatever it is. Um, the thing is here, it takes a long time. So that pat on the back that reassure, you know, the sense of reassurance that have done something, it's out there, it's substantial, it doesn't come easy. So, so you have to be patient uh, without, in some senses, knowing that with very few milestones as well. And the PhD is in, in the US, for example, is divided with these three parts. You have your coursework phase, your field work phase, and your dissertation phase. And sure, you get some feedback during the coursework phase, but chances are you're not going to get a lot of feedback during your fieldwork phase or even your dissertation phase. So you have to sort of like motivate yourself, power your engines through it. While also remembering that a PhD tends to be varies by discipline. You know, if you're in a lab, you tend to have more company, but if you're in the humanities or in the social sciences, it tends to be a lot more solitary work, right? So there are a couple of these other things that also prospective PhD aspirants should be mindful of. Uh, in this respect. We can talk more about other things, but I think this is important to that. <clears throat> yeah. Um, yeah, I know. So we, we have a bunch of questions. And before we segue into the questions, I wanted to touch on one thing and ask you guys one thing because it, it matters to me a lot. So um, like, if you take a step back, apart from those PhD things, what ways do you still continue to engage with the YF community or the, the Shoka community at large? And like, I can speak to that because so, um, we do have chapters across different cities and across this thing. So like for me to find a chapter in Chicago where I am it took hard, but I did find a bunch of people, you know, so like the chapters are one way in which I still mean like try to, you know, keep myself abreast with all the happenings at Ashoka and at the fellowship. And uh, so that's, that's one thing I do. And the other thing is the alumni mentorship program. So I was, I kind of took part in that. I kept kind of help organize it while I was there in the fellowship, but also participated in it as well. And so like one of the things I've signed up for is to be an alumni mentor and any questions about a higher education or a master's in engineering, like, Hey, I have tons of things to tell you, like, think carefully before you do this but you know so these are some of the ways that i uh, like I've, I've still tried to like engage with the community because it's given so much to me that i I'd like to give back uh, you guys have touched upon it a lot like uh, as you say you work with tcpd or you you did a course or you taught a course but what are some other ways you've continued to engage even today that you know just good to keep in mind just good for like a panelist to know i mean our audience to know as well anyone can take a stab at that yeah well uh my Answer to this is going to be like really short, but I, I want to kind of emphasize, I spent four years at Ashoka, including the YF, the MLS and the TCPD. I didn't really have to go out of my way to engage with the community because the community for me was always there. So uh, I, 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 I hope love has a better answer. Uh, but uh, yeah, for, for me, I, I was I was there uh, and like Ashoka changed over the time that I was there. Uh, uh, the community that I, I, I kind of call my community earlier was just the YF patch, then it became the undergrads, uh, the YFs who like kind of came in and went. So, uh, yeah, I, I mean, 
my, my engagement was more like about where I was at that point of time and not really through these formal networks. So I, I'm, I'm hoping Love has a better kind of take on this. Thanks, Aluni. I think, I think in some senses, both of us are on the exceptional side of things since we both had engagements at Ashoka. In, you know, you've had a more sustained engagement, I've had a more intermittent engagement. But as George mentioned, there are these formal channels. Uh, there is the, the, the Alumni Association and there are these chapters. Uh, and, you know, I'd contested elections for the, uh, uh, for the alumni elections some time ago and I'd lost. Uh, so I also engaged on those fronts. Uh, but but uh, so, so, so there is the formal engagement through these, these spaces, right? Then there's the informal engagement, you know, just knowing that someone's in a shokan, not even a vibe, in a shokan, mm -hmm. right? Uh, there is a sense of, may not be universally felt, I, I won't speak for everybody, but there seems to me to be a sense of camaraderie. People reach out and talk to each other. You could be in India, you could be in Europe, you could be in America, East Asia, wherever it is. But chances are you'll find common ground. And I think that becomes important. But then also platforms such as this, right? When, when, when the organizers uh, reached out asking us to participate, I didn't think really twice about this. You know, this is another way to, to give back, uh, to have these conversations. And like you, George, I also, you know, have had you know, mentorship, you know, duties over several years. A lot of that happens, but I continue also to maintain a deep goodwill towards Ashoka. I love Ashoka. I think it's a great institution and it's doing fantastic work and it's going to do even more work. And um, I had the chance to come back to teach, for example, uh, which was another way for me to re-engage with folks. And, and when I was there, I was also hanging out with my folks. And some of those wire folks are still in touch with me, right? Uh, and back and forth, and, th and this kind of stuff keeps happening. And then you run into people everywhere, right? It, it, it could be at a cafe in, in Mumbai, right? It could be at a cafe in New York. It could be at a formal, so to speak, webinar or a policy gathering or something of like that. But I think that tends to stay alive. Uh, and then, you know, just sort of like finding these things to do together, it helps. And of course, the Alumni Association is it's, it's well-structured and it's doing a lot of very interesting things. And uh, such as, for example, organizing activities. Uh, people, for example, might you know, volunteer at a school, right? Help stray dogs in their, in their city, things like that. Those patterns. And then of course my own friends and, through, and their friends and, and their friends' as friends, uh, that beneficial, so to speak, network effect. Uh, I'm not on any social media, I should clarify. Uh, so, so, and I still feel connected, right? In some sense, I'm able to also avoid the violence of social media. Uh, but I'm also able to feel connected. So I don't feel like I need uh, those kinds of public platforms uh, to be in touch with the community. It, it just happens, and I'm grateful for that. Thank you, Love. <clears throat> so, yeah, I'm pretty much done with like, like some of the things we wanted to talk about. We can segue into some of the questions and answers that have been pouring in, unless Saloni or Love, you want to make some more, like, <clears throat> Something else came to mind and it's like, oh, people should really know about this, but I think we can come up with that. Yeah, I have one of those things. So, um, yeah, now that I think back, uh, one of the things in which like we kind of engaged with the YA community was uh, when I was working at the Trivedi Center for Political Data, again, for people who are interested in research, we actually uh, had floated an ELM for a couple of years with the number of teams who are working there. So uh, uh, essentially, these are the projects or like the part time work that you kind of uh, pick up on say a Friday or a Saturday uh, when you're at the fellowship. That's that's what the ELM is. So um, some of the centers at Ashoka also float ELM projects which you could be working on and, and that's been one of the ways where I, like, I have also been kind of uh, you know working with ELM teams uh, in terms of like the, the, what, what they're uh, expected to do uh, on the weekly basis as a part of the fellowship but also beyond that like you know or what they're interested in and like, you know, just as being like, oh, I, I've been there, I've done this. So like, you know, where can I help <laughs> in, in that sense? So that's just another way in which like, I think alumni continue to kind of engage with the YF community uh, and create opportunities that like, ideally would have been great if, you know, were available when they were there during the fellowship. Uh, and, and I see that as like one of the things that that's like really helpful for fellows who are joining now, uh, particularly now. No, for sure, that makes sense. Like the experiential learning module was vital in helping me think about what I wanted to do after my master's. And the only reason I am working in the kind of space that I am in project, which is psychic cross-functional tech, 
is strongly because of my experience at the ELM where I was working with nonprofits and I was thinking about impact, about what it means to have technology products that just do things or does it help people? And so like thinking of impact in technology is what I got to think about a lot through my ELM and the experiential learning model. And it's something that I'm so happy to see alumni floating experiential learning mod modules or you know, other centers floating experiential learning models. So that's great to see that, you know, they can feed into that learning cycle. So that's great to see, yeah. yeah. Cool. <clears throat> uh, George, if I may very briefly as well, uh, this is slightly different. This is actually very different from Saloni's point about ELM, very valuable point that. Uh, I, was, I was thinking a little bit about um, a thing I think it's important to emphasize is many people think tend to think of the why in instrumental terms. Right? I'll come to the why, and I'll I'll achieve X Y Z objective. Yes. I, I don't want to moralize that. It, it may work for some people, it may not work for some other, some other people. But I think it's extremely important to stay open to. I mean, this this webinar is called uh, Pathways of Possibility. It's important to remain open to other kinds of possibilities that the program offers. Right? So you may never have thought, for example, about the discipline of social psychology, right? And how, for example, it might feed into user research. I don't know, right? Maybe it does. You may, you may not have really been exposed to the idea that you could, you know, do good things for the environment and still make a, a reasonable living, right? And that happens because of a random course you took on, in, on the environment, right? So I think even if you do come with a set of plans, I think, I think it's, and I would, you know, say it's important to stay open to what other disciplines, people, mentors, scholars, practitioners can throw up. Uh, and to keep that, uh, so to speak, thing open. Unless, of course, you're absolutely set, set on what you want to do. And th then it's a different story. But otherwise, uh, I think the wife tends to attract people who also want to explore. And I think keeping that explore, exploration quotient high is, tends to, will probably be rewarding in the long term. Right. Yeah. And one thing like, so that I'll, so we, we can jump into some of the question and answers and love, you kind of touched upon some of the themes and the questions that have come up is like, okay, like, how did you use your, how do you use the fellowship to do your master's or your PhD? And so you kind of talk like touched upon the fact that um, coming in, there are very tactical things you can do. I need to do this. I need to learn this. I can explore this. I can explore that. And the fellowship gives you a bit of those opportunities through interacting faculty, brushing up on research, doing projects, talking to industry veterans to help you think these through. But as you mentioned, there are also a lot of other, like it, it sets you up with the environment and the facilities for you to do that sort of exploration to get to where you want to be and not necessarily just the tactical elements of do this, do this, do that. And then, hey, you're set. You're going to start off on your five-year PhD journey and then, you know, yeah. <laughs> Great. Um, let me just take a look. Did you guys have seen one of the questions that you guys wanted to answer off the top of your head? Or I can just dig into some of the questions that we have here. Just give me a second. So there's a question on doing uh, a non-STEM masters um, in the US and, and whether uh, that is uh, desirable or not. I think the, uh, George, you want to take a first cut at it since you did a, a STEM masters in the US. Sure. And then awesome. I, have, I have a few things to say after you. Sure. There's a question that here is, um, how does one leverage their YF education towards pursuing a master's in international affairs or public policy and would work experience for a year or so count at universities? Um, doing a non-STEM master's in the US is something a lot of people have recommended me not to go for. Would you guys advise the same? Also, if you want to get into world institutions with a master's like these help in some way or the other. Um, so this kind of touches upon some of the tactical elements. So at, at least for me, personally, like I did my master's in computer engineering, which was a STEM degree. Um, none of my employers really knew what the Young India Fellowship was. I mean, they're not expected to, you know. So uh, it didn't really, so for the technical roles I was applying, it didn't really matter as much. For the cross-functional roles I was applying for, it, it was more about how I framed it, how I framed my projects, how I framed my experience, and how I was pitching myself as a candidate. So the why gave me the material and the, an approach of, help me think about the approach of how I wanted to pitch myself in this day and age with such a diverse workforce. How do I differentiate myself? So the YF helped in that regard, but as a degree on paper, it wasn't really something that really stood out. So that was one. Um, doing a non-STEM masters in the US. Um, so this, as you said, it, it kind of dives into a bit of the, the tactical elements of, oh, is the masters you're going to do? Does it fit in with the visa regulations of your country? And so I think that's a very, 
personal and subjective thing from person to person, depending on what degree you're going for, depending on what country you're going for. So there are a lot of risks to take into account. Um, as you know, the market is all supply and demand. So if you're a tech major, there are tech jobs, if you're STEM, pipeline works that way. If you are non-tech, you have to do your research. So because I, from a tech background, I can speak to that about the whole non-STEM, STEM visa things. Uh, but that's a very tactical thing that you just have to do your research on. You have to talk to people who are studying those programs, who are in those kind of roles that you want to. It's not something that I believe I would be comfortable advocating for saying, hey, this is the way to go for. But Saloni Love, you know, feel free to touch upon those, these topics because they, take a pass at that. George, you're absolutely right. And I completely agree with you. A lot depends on like specific context, details of like what you're thinking about, where you want to go, what, what where you are right now. So uh, it, it's extremely context specific. So I would say that, you know, like given that there's not much details, uh, uh, I think it will be best to kind of defer this question to something that's like more general uh, and, and again we're, we're happy to talk about this one-on-one -on -one. and like I want to again plug in that if you're kind of interested in like knowing more about like doctoral education in general like feel free to like kind of send me a message on like LinkedIn or like Twitter where I'm like kind of active so uh, yeah I mean you can like get in touch uh, definitely about these like kind of specific questions uh, but yeah a lot depends uh, uh, on like specifics uh, for me to kind of well further on this. Uh, Love, do you want to kind of jump in here? Thanks, Aloni, George. Yeah, I, I, I echo that more, more, uh, more context-rich, uh, so to speak, question would, would help us articulate a response. But I also echo Saloni's um, offer. Should you wish to have uh, a more detailed conversation, please feel free to reach out. I think the wife can share an email or something. Just find me online. I also exist on LinkedIn. So but, but to this particular question, uh, the first part of this on leveraging the wire towards pursuing a master's in international affairs and public policy, the wire gives you access uh, to some really good courses by some highly acclaimed, highly regarded scholars in international affairs, international relations, public policy. So you must take those classes for starters. Uh, try and forge, I would imagine, uh, a relationship with those individuals. You know, again, depends on what the timeline is. Are you doing the YF and are you looking to do the master's right after? Or are you looking to do a year's experience after the YF? What do you do in that one year? Can you find a way to work with these set scholars through a teaching uh, T TF ship, for example, in the interim period? There are lots of different ways to do this. But I think it would also depend really on the program, specific programs in Canada, Singapore, European universities and what they are looking for. Right? Many of these programs, for example, may not look for research papers. Some, may, some might. So you have to meet those uh, requirements as it goes. As far as the non-STEM masters go, it again depends a lot you know, on, on which program you're doing, how much money you're spending or not spending. Uh, very often people say don't do a STEM masters because you, there's something called the OPT, the optional uh, practical training, which basically means you don't need a work visa and you can work in the States for a certain amount of period. So you can effectively earn back any amount of money that you might have spent in getting that degree. Uh, that period, that OPT period is, is reduced for non-STEM majors, but this is again a fairly uh, loose, so to speak, category. It's not like, you know, for example, certain kinds of data science in, in, in the kind of work that Saloni does could fit into that category, uh, for example. Uh, so it, it, it varies a lot. I would say rather than thinking about it purely on those terms, also think, think about it in terms of what you seek to gain intellectually, emotionally, spiritually from a program of this kind. And also keep some trust in, in the ways of the universe. Uh, it sounds easy to look back and say, you know, things work out okay. It doesn't always work out okay, but it works out. It tends to work out in one way or the other. Keep the faith. I think I think that's an important uh, takeaway that George Saloni, both of us were talking about. And I was keeping the faith. Faith is important. And then things can sort of like find a way. Thanks for articulating like that, love. Yeah. Um, one question I think Saloni and Love, you guys are well prepped to answer that question is, there's a question, can we talk about the kind of work that scholars get to pursue after a doctorate? Uh, I'm under the impression that people who pursue a PhD in the humanities end up teaching at universities and having an academic career. Are there other possibilities? So if you guys could touch upon, hey, if you do a PhD in this, what are all the different routes out there? Because after all, this is a pathways of possibilities panel webinar. So what are the pathways of possibilities after a PhD? In what you guys do, please. Saloni, if I may take a first time with this. Okay, thanks. Um, there's actually a lot that you can do, right? It's not true, contrary to even what I said in terms of general perceptions. 
I think a lot of programs worldwide are realizing that the the ratio of PhD awardees to PhD teaching positions is extremely small. So a large number of PhD awardees simply will never have the opportunity to teach in a good institution or or such like if, if should they want to. Many people do not have that aspiration. Many people many people do. Now, depending on the kind of program you choose to do, if you're working in you know very specific kind of, for example, movement. A human movement, you might find yourself working for some kind of a, I don't know, bioprosthetic firm and in a corporation. You could go from there into a more general role. You can enter the corporate corporation, you can enter government, you can enter policy formulation and such like. You could start up your own business or something of that kind as well. Uh, I there, there, are, there is a whole industry now about telling PhDs what to do outside of the academy. Right? Uh, one of my favorite quotes uh, from, 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 from one such uh, a uh, remarkable exponent is a PhD can do what an MBA can do, what an MBA can't do, what a PhD can do, <laughs> right? <laughs> it varies a lot, again, uh, by, by program and by discipline. But I think the sentiment is true. You get a very specialized degree, but that specialized degree also often gives you transferable skills. Now, the question is, are those transferable skills immediately going to distinguish you from other people in the, in the, in the work that you choose to do? Right? Or does do you, do you start where someone start started with say a master's degree after a PhD, or if you did five years for a PhD, do you start you know where someone is two years after completing a master's and doing that job? How does it work out? What are your aspirations? Right? Uh, but really, you know, there is a plethora of opportunities. Again, a lot depends on where you do your where you get your degree from. If it's from a well-known institution, if it's well networked, if it's, it's, it's if it's a name that people recognize you're able to find jobs for yourself. And I think there tends to be a campus placement culture in Indian institutions. This is, this is absolutely untrue for most uh, institutions in other parts of the world. So a lot depends on how you choose yourself, how you see your career planning out. And just the nature of a PhD, you know, what, what a humanities individual does, and in fact, what two humanities scholars might do, might be so different that what one humanities person might be able to do after their PhD would be remarkably different from another person would. So there is no general answer for this. I think the two things, two, three things to keep in mind is a PhD, at, at least in, in, in the States, in, in, in Northern Europe, Western Europe, is pretty much like a job. Uh, you are paid to perform certain duties over a certain period of time, right? You're not paying, you should not be paying for a PhD. Some places still make you pay for a PhD, but you shouldn't. If you think of it this way, then you're getting experience in this kind of work. Uh, you're, you're getting that training and you're able to deploy some of that training in other kinds of things, like, for example, project management, in, in research management, knowledge management, carrying out specific kinds of research, doing statistical data work, for example. And then how you choose to work that subsequently, uh, it really, really comes down to how you want to play the game. But, but there are some things, of course, that wouldn't immediately be open to you. You could do, for example, a PhD in, in textual analytics of 15th century medieval prose. And then if you seek a job in, I don't know, in investment banking, maybe it's going to be a hard case for you to make. Possible? Why not? I, I, I'm, I'm, not I'm not saying this facetiously. I'm, I'm saying this with some grounding, right? You could do a PhD in astrophysics and then get a job in investment banking. Or you could do a PhD in economics and then become, you know, a, a, a politician, right? All kinds of things are possible. I think as a, as a short answer. Yeah, again, uh, for, for me, uh... Uh, I completely echo Love's point on like uh, uh, there are a bunch of transferable skills that the PhD gives you outside of like uh, just being in academia. So like okay, let me just like spill it out there. Uh, essentially, most the idea is that a lot of PhD, uh, PhD grantees are going to be working in academic institutions, either teaching, uh, either doing research, uh, or doing some kind of administrative work, uh, or or like essentially. Uh, uh, any of these or all of these at different points of time in their career, right? So, uh, so that that's that's true for say a fraction of PhD awardees. But but again, a lot of them kind of go on to work for other kinds of organizations. And where you kind of leverage the education uh, during your PhD really depends on what you end up doing during your PhDs. And like again, uh, at at the kind of uh, I'm not trying to essentialize, but like I think the best way to kind of think of it, at least, uh, is is in terms of like, are you looking? What kind of research are you doing? What's like your area? What's your field? Uh, uh, and then like again, what kind of methods are you doing to do research? Uh, uh, and and 
essentially for me, at least in the social sciences, the, the kind of work that you could see yourself doing is either like qualitative work, archival work, or quantitative work. And all of them have their own kind of merits and their kind of, you know, uh, opportunities that they present to you post a PhD. So, um, uh, for quantitative methods, I think it, it becomes more evident, like you can look at uh, jobs uh, which could be advertised to like either uh, data scientists or computer scientists, uh, statistical analysis, that, that's where you kind of go with it. But but I think for like for the qualitative work, I think there's this like this whole world of like uh, kind of getting at uh, user experience research and those are the kind of like really interesting jobs that, that focus on like uh, hardcore qualitative research, participant observations and stuff uh, such like. So uh, it really depends again on what you do during your PhD or like fields or where you're looking to go with it. But yes, it does give you transferable skills. Um, just finally on like a word of caution, uh, at least for me, at least the way that I, I've kind of thought about certain kinds of PhDs is like uh, when you go on to get like higher education, uh, Typically, and I'm making like gross generalizations, but like typically you kind of, you know, kind of broaden the, uh, your career opportunities, what you do. When you do a PhD, I feel for, again, for certain programs, and this could not be true for all, but to some extent you are narrowing down. And, and the kind of, uh, and again, I'm, I'm comparing to like things like maybe an MBA, something that's more general. Right. So if you're thinking of higher education in those terms, to some extent, yes, the PhD does narrow out what you could be doing post your PhD. But again, it, it's again very, very dependent on your specific fields, the specific kind of work you end up doing uh, and, and the kind of questions and the methods that you're drawn to. So uh, I'm guessing with like some caveat, maybe you could take like what I said in the last two minutes. Uh, yeah. Can I can I briefly come in there, George, if that's OK? I think Saloni is absolutely spot on in this respect. I think the other factor that often plays in here is self-selection. Individuals with PhD often carry a badge on their shoulders. Oh, I'm a doctor. I'm not going to do some other work. Why? Right? So, I mean, without sort of like, you know, I'm not saying that you do spend five years specializing in something and then do something completely diametrically opposite. Right? But if you stay open to a, a set of things that you may not have thought that you would do, you can still distinguish yourself in, in the work that you seek to do. Having said that, a PhD, as somebody said, is not a generalist program. But then the question is, I, what, what is the menu of options that you're seeking to have for yourself? We live, unfortunately, better or worse, in an age in which, we pri in, in which we privilege optionality. Like, as though having more options is a, is a good thing. That need not necessarily be the case. If that's not the case, and if you think of a PhD as not something that is preparing you for a career, but as a step in your career, right? Most careers for this generation will be extremely diverse, right? What you do in your first five years will not be what you do in the next 10 years, will not be what you do in your next 10 years after that. So the PhD becomes a part of them. You think of this as a way to move across these different careers. Then you have uh, lots of lots of opportunities. <clears throat> right. No, well said. Nobody asked, but since I'm from the engineering tech space, I'll put a quick plug in for PhDs in engineering and tech. Uh, like I said, you, a lot of them end up working in laboratories. But there are a lot of industry collaborations with laboratories that professors have that have industry connections. So there's a lot of work happening there. And I know a bunch of people who have done their PhDs in computer engineering, economics, or moved into consulting. Ernst & Young was a big fan of taking PhD students from Georgia Tech for some reason. So there are all these parts that exist. But like I said, do your background, do your homework, find out because it varies from place to place. And at the end of the day, there's a lot that goes into this. So yeah. Um, Another quick light question I will throw at you is what qualities would set one up for success in the YIR? It's a question that uh, has popped and I think that, you know, we, we do have quite a few people in the webinar who are looking to apply for the fellowship. So what would you say is, hey, like, what are the qualities to have before you come in or while you're in there? Take a quick stab at that. I shall go then well, <laughs> at least in the admission process, I would just say like, there's no one formula for the candidate at the fellowship. As you know, we've all talked about the different backgrounds we come from. So there's no one way to say, Hey, this is the ideal candidate for the young India fellowship. No, just be yourself. And like, as long as you know, or you come in with some ideas to so like, Hey, this is how I think I want this fellowship journey to work out with me. This is what I'm looking to try out. Think, be yourself and you should be fine. 
And while you're at the fellowship, I think one of the qualities that sets you up for success is just being open to things. Like, I think that takes you way ahead and helps you experience a lot more in the fellowship if you just open to things. So that's my two cents of this question. You know. Yeah. Uh, so com completely agree. Be be open to ideas. Be curious. I think these are like things that, that are like hallmarks of uh, uh, young India fellows. Uh, uh, one thing again, and this is like maybe a personal bias, and I'm, I'm again going to heavily caveat that yes, this this is something that I, I feel I've seen. I think just having a good answer to why do you want to do the YAF, and and you can think through this when you're like kind of writing the application or when you're talking to your parents trying to convince them like, hey, there's this program that's happening and like it's interesting and I want to do it or 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 uh, what have you. I think I think just kind of answering that question not satisfactorily for others but at least for yourself having a good answer to that uh, will really kind of you know in, in George's words set you up for success in the YAF. At, at the risk of uh, sounding like the old philosopher that nobody wants to listen to what is success but no not a joke not a joke I mean like sure in the pre-admission stage you might say the metric of success is getting admission right is that really so? Sometimes maybe getting not getting admission is a metric of success because maybe you're not a fit for the program, right? So I think what Saloni said about being honest to yourself about why you want to do the program is, is important, is, is, is very, very important. Subsequently in the program, you know, and generally I would imagine you know, as, as an ethic, so to speak, uh, keeping a certain kind of humility, uh, which would find expression in being open to learning, open to other points of view, open, being open to, you know, other contesting opinions and such like is important. Uh, being willing to work hard uh, is would also be would also be and, and keeping the grit because you know life is going to be full of ups and downs uh, in the fellowship post the fellowship subsequently and then at the end of this George as you said as you said very rightly keeping it cool right you know not getting too too deeply worked up and the idea was you know you might think of things like questioning the questions in some senses but with an intention not to tear down right the idea is eventually I would imagine please, again, this is a personal bias, is not to tear down people around you, not to tear down what they stand for, what they think about the world, to negotiate for sure, but also build each other up. And so to even question with the intention not to tear down, but perhaps question with the intention to build up. And I think that over a very long period of time will, will give you community success. George, you're muted. Yeah, I was going through some technical difficulties, but I'm back. Okay, uh, we do have a question on scholarships and the availability, the support. Like it's very loaded question, depends on the program, but if you guys want to have like a quick approach into scholarships, I think that may help some of our um, the viewers who would love like that question. In. So is this um, scholarships on the program, the YF program, or, or for like higher education? For higher education abroad, like yeah, what support exists to find out about them. Mm -hmm. I can I can again speak for like doctoral education because that's that's what I've kind of been focused on. But like essentially, because also that's an easy answer. Most like PhD programs are fully funded. Um, you get uh, full tuition revision. You don't have to pay any tuition fees pay most tuition fees and uh, you also get like a stipend uh, that covers like your basic uh, living costs and sustenance during the course of, of graduate school and and over and about that you're also depending on your eligibility you can also kind of raise funds from a number of different research grants during the course of your PhD so um, suffice it to say that you know uh, if uh, you were going to uh, going to through the like PhD route in the US again again let me also kind of focus because the UK is like a completely different um, ball game and I, I think uh, again for, for people who are interested in the UK or, or Europe they should kind of reach out to people uh, and get those specifics but at least in the US it's fully funded your university or your department guarantees uh, both your funding and uh, uh, tuition for you for for the course of your PhD um yeah, yeah. That's so let me, from a master's perspective so like i'd applied for two scholarships and um like there is a lot of support like the the yf team if you reach out you say hey this is the kind of things i'm looking at is there a list of scholarships i can apply for i know for a fact there were a bunch of lists that have been floated around on our email threads about hey 
these are all the scholarship programs that exist out there so there is like there are a lot of avenues for getting these sort of resources and even for the scholarships i did apply for before coming for my masters one of my recommenders was from the fellowship it was shankar krishnan was the uh, yeah he was like he he wrote my recommendation letter as well so you do have a lot of avenues for support in terms of finding out resources for scholarships for programs that you want to do even after the fellowship yeah I, I think just uh, very briefly, and I think Saloni, what Saloni said about doctoral programs is is right. Uh, but I would alert that even for the U.S., not all doctoral programs promise a five-year package. They would say we'll cover you for two years, and then we expect you to do teaching assignments to pay your, you know, to pay your bills or raise funding otherwise to do your bills. Many other programs will say we'll fund you while you're here, but you need to raise funding for your own field work. So it it varies a lot by program. Uh, but one expects to be paid to do a PhD. uh which is usually not the case for for a masters program similarly in in europe or in the uk especially in europe the typically flow, flow job advertisements and you apply as as you know getting getting a job is actually so these are you you sort of like become part of a research program that you know an institutional member faculty member is already carrying out and you make a pitch for that and you if you're successful you end up joining it varies again by in india for example you have the grf net system ashoka has a slightly different uh, admission pro program it has a uh it's on ashoka has its own doctoral programs now in a number of different disciplines they have they have some really really good strong programs over there as well and they have their own they follow the american model uh a little bit over there and as for masters george you you've done this route but there are a number of opportunities out there um and you know one has to be careful you know to sift through uh, and find that which is relevant but i think one of the tricks here which which is not very often spoken about partly because it's hard to speak about this and saloni indicated this briefly is that the institution that you go to will often have funding packages that are not well advertised right partly because they're not meant to be well advertised but when you're there it can provide really important support you know it could be a $5000 grant or a $10000 grant to see you through some summer or something of that kind and and that can go a really long way and i think to know that it's important to talk to people in those institutions whether in the masters program or in the pg program and say what are the specific resources that your institution your department your program give uh, to its students right makes sense love and then you you framed it quite well at the end of the day it a lot of the answers are it depends and do your due diligence but hey you know like <laughs> no it's very true and um so i know we are almost at time and so there are some questions that we did not get to because it's slightly more tactical and in the weeds but i think that if anyone does have any follow up questions uh, the by program team is super responsive and their, their their email addresses and their forms are all over the website you can feel free to ask them there uh, i think i'm not going to say hey spam saloni and love but i think they can speak to the fact that they are available on different social media handles some more than others uh to be reached out to for any questions but uh yeah so that's about the question so any parting words of saloni love for our for this webinar it is it is great talking to you like at least from my perspective it is great to hear your journeys like the social sciences has always been something that has fascinated me and i've been very grateful and i've had a great experience having peers like you guys who have been through this journey so i can learn a lot from so thank you for your time today I think you're on mute. Sorry. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Uh, yeah. I, I really enjoyed kind of reflecting on the YF, and uh, I think in in terms of like what I would kind of leave with is like by all means a doctoral program is not the only way to do what you really want to do. Uh, there are definitely a bunch of other avenues that where you can kind of you know look. uh look at and do similar kinds of work that you would kind of be doing uh during or after a doctoral program so uh but having said that uh uh i can like say that for for someone like me i think again why i'm here again uh doing a phd is because it's definitely something that i've enjoyed the most in my life uh beyond like you know kind of working in an organization working in a think tank uh it's something that kind of makes me excited so to say to wake up in the morning which, which a lot of people can kind of say uh so so if it's something that you kind of really uh think that you want to do and you you think you would enjoy i i think the best way again is like all of us have kind of said you need to reach out to people do your homework talk to people who are doing things that you find interesting and try to figure out you know uh understand where you fit uh, and where like you kind of 
feel that your interests kind of fit uh, in, in like this this whole space. So uh, I would like both encourage and discourage people <laughs> from from PhD, but like uh, encourage because like it's great, and discourage because hey, PhD is not the only way to do what you want to do. So <laughs> uh, so in a sense, like just um, yeah, that's, that's it. Thank you for that, Saloni. Any parting words, love? Building off what Saloni just said. Doing a PhD is not the only path to doing what you want to do. And doing the YF is not the only path to doing a PhD, <laughs> right? Uh, you don't have to do the YF to do a PhD, right? You don't have to do the PhD to live a good life or to do meaningful work. Uh, be honest to yourself. I would say, you know, know what you want to do and why you want to do it. Be willing to take risks. Uh, keep the faith. Uh, one of the most, I think, timeless philosophers of our time uh, said, Hakuna Matata, don't worry, be happy. You know, there is something to be said for that. Things will happen. But of course, be honest to yourself, work hard and, you know, reach out, talk to people, echo what Saloni said. Do your preparation, right? Uh, preparation is important. And be honest to yourself and then trust, trust the world to do what you want to do. Yes. And on that note, I think Hakuna Matata is good signing off words. Thank you, love. Glenn? Thank you, George, yeah. Glenn, the, the program team, Saloni, wonderful talking once again. And... Uh, Thank you for organizing this. Yeah, thank you so much, guys. It was uh, it was an insightful and amazing discussion. And uh, I personally got to take in a lot of uh, insights. And I'm pretty sure everyone else would also uh, have, everyone else got a lot to learn from it. So thank you so much. And uh, it was an amazing experience, yeah. Yeah, thanks a lot for putting this together. Yeah. Thank you.